Hope you enjoyed the little break. Uh, since this is my first time at the microphone today, I'll just say hello. Uh, I'm Libby, in case I didn't get to say hi to you all. I'm really, really glad that you're all here. I've emailed you so many times. <laughs> it's really great to see you in person, not on Zoom. Uh, I also wanted to take a second to say, uh, at request of one of our amazing comms team members, use our hashtag. <laughs> it is Pulitzer Weekend 22. Uh, and that works on Twitter, it works on Instagram. You can also tag us at Pulitzer Center, uh, and we'd love to feature your, your posts. So Pulitzer Weekend 22, keep that in mind. Uh, and I'm also excited to introduce our second panel of the day. This is gonna be our climate and environment panel, one of two, I think. We'll have more environment-focused stories uh, later in the weekend. Uh, so just to quickly introduce our panelists, starting off, we have Claire Potter, our University of Chicago fellow who traveled to Mexico. We have Sydney Schuler from Hampton University. Sydney traveled to Chennai, India. We have Neve McAuliffe from Hunter College who traveled to Ireland. Natasha Heisenberg of Wake Forest University, whose reporting focuses on the Faroe Islands. Danielle Philjohn, who will travel to South Africa sometime soon to report. Uh, and Danielle's from Flagler College. And one kind of unique thing with this panel, we're gonna end things with uh, a digital recorded presentation from Grace Kajski. She's our 2022 Yale Fellow, and she wasn't able to make it to Washington Weekend. So with all of that said, I will hand it over to Claire. So this summer, I was in Mexico City reporting on the water crisis and urban planners who are looking to nature to solve it. I will start with a bit of history. Mexico City is in a high altitude valley in central Mexico. Hundreds of years ago, it was filled with water. There was a system of saltwater and freshwater lakes and over 40 rivers. The indigenous cultures integrated water into their farms and their cities. The Aztecs even built their capital, Tenochtitlan, in the middle of the largest of those lakes. But after the Spanish conquered in 1521, they had a very different relationship with the region's water. They struggled with repeated floods after they built their capital over the ruins of Tenochtitlan. And so they decided to drain the valley. Essentially, they thought of the Valley of Mexico like a bathtub and they needed to take the plug out. And this initiated a centuries long infrastructure project, first under the Spanish and then under an independent Mexico. And here are photographs from the 19th century uh, showing the digging of a massive drainage canal. Uh, and now Mexico City looks like this. It is a city of well over 21 million people in the metro area and it is dry. There are, very, there are pockets of the original ecosystem, but they are themselves damaged and under threat, even as they remain critical to the city's environmental health. To provide this mega city with water, they wells pump from an aquifer that is rapidly being depleted, and the city is falling into its aquifer. Some neighborhoods are sinking at a rate of at least nine feet a year. Uh, the rest of the city's water, about 30%, comes from distant water basins and it is pumped against gravity at enormous expense. And now uh, the day where water runs dry, where those distant water basins cannot provide the water when the aquifer is empty looms. But for millions, the water crisis is already very present. At least 20% of the city cannot rely on water coming out of their taps. For example, I interviewed Tumer Sinda, a woman who lives in Iztapalapa, a neighborhood in the west of Mexico City, and she spends hours and hours each week managing her household's water, reusing it from the wash to wash the dog, or uh, bargaining with water truck drivers to get regular supplies of water, and when it arrives, it's polluted. A uh, rainwater captivation system helps, but it only works during the rainy season. Uh, the urban planners at the center of my story uh, want to resuscitate the natural water cycle. Today, uh, all, there is no means of capturing rainwater at a citywide scale 
or recycling wastewater. Instead, it is simply dumped outside of the Valley of Mexico, polluted. They want to build artificial wetlands. They want to build holding lakes. They want to sow nature back into the city that was once had such a rich ecosystem. One of the early or projects that really catalyzed this movement was an ecoduct, which opened in 2017. It, it runs in the middle of a six lane highway. That highway is built over uh, where a river once flowed. That river became so polluted with sewage that it was put into a pipe in the 40s. Uh, in this park, uh, water is pumped out of the sewage pipe then put through a series of wetlands. And by the end, it can flow clear. And this project uh, inspired a flurry of other small wetlands across the city and was a real symbol of hope. Um, but now it is itself no longer maintained. There isn't the political will to maintain it. And people who are excited by this progress also worry that these projects are not at the scale they need to be to address the crisis. Although I don't have time to talk about all of the amazing projects I've learned about in Mexico City, another that really fascinated me was actually outside the exact borders of Mexico City. Uh, Gustavo Madrid is from the Apan Plains, an agricultural region near Mexico City. And studies show that the aquifer below Mexico City is actually connected to the aquifer below this agricultural region. And here, he wants to recover the natural ecosystem in a place where there's more space to do it, where it's not so heavily urbanized, and to slow water on the land so that it has space to filter into the aquifer. And he is really challenging people to rethink the, the borders of managing water, because water doesn't obey the political boundaries of the city. Um, and I just wanted to conclude by saying that one of the things that continually impressed me when I was in Mexico City was the people I met who, despite being often frustrated by corruption that stymied projects they put years into, or a lack of political will to address one of their city's most urgent crises, continue to work for free and put in hours and hours of their lives uh, to get momentum behind projects they believed in. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sydney Schuler, and I am a May 2022 graduate of Hampton University. I'm currently a reporter covering the University of Virginia at the Daily Progress newspaper in Charlottesville, Virginia. For my Pulitzer reporting project, I traveled to Chennai, the city of 11.2 million people in southern India, to report on sustainable and nature-based solutions to water scarcity. Um, so just to start, India is home to, I mean, Chennai, excuse me, is home to expert water researchers and urban architects who are breaking ground on the future of green metropolitan infrastructure for the city. Um, so in June 19, 2019, Chennai experienced a rare water phenomenon called Day Zero, where its local water municipality ran out of sufficient water to supply all of its customers. As I mentioned before, the city holds 11.2 million residents. Um, so this left most of the residents without running drinking and fresh water for, about, for up to three weeks, depending on where people were um, and what they were able to afford at the time. Now there's um, a lot of work that was already being done to sustain the freshwater sources in Chennai um, to clean up pollution and things like that before 2019. But after day zero, a lot of those green plans really kicked into high gear. Um, so the reality for most low caste Chennaiites, especially if you're not familiar, Chennai and most of India operates on a caste system um, similar to how America operates on a system of racism. Um, so. While I was there, I visited two uh, villages known as slums where I saw children at home, as this young lady was in the middle of the school day, um, helping their mothers uh, pump water from an outdoor faucet that was shared among three to five homes in the village at once. Um, this water was often used to clean dishes, um, clean clothes, and then it was boiled to be used for the same purpose. There are times, uh, even today, where people only have access to this water every three days. Um, it was even more sporadic 
in 2019 following day zero. Um, pollution is also a severe problem among within the main water sources um, in Chennai. This photo was taken right outside of one of those slums that I mentioned before. Um, and so a lot of these people who are located in polluted areas are, are, are evicted um, to projects like this one on the right um, that are located right on top of industrial power plants and things that are have harmful health effects um, and are not much better than the situation they were in before. So the reason that I traveled to Chennai really is to look into the City of a Thousand Tanks Consortium, which is a group of Chennai and Netherlands-based uh, researchers, educators, architects who, are, who have come together to find sustainable solutions that are rooted in nature for creating micro water systems that, are more, that better serve the communities where they are located rather than citywide systems. Uh, so since starting in 2019, City of a Thousand Tanks has labeled four flagship projects where they will be building these different water systems um, and employing these different methods, pilot methods that they will be testing. Um, the first that I went to was the Little Flower Convent, which is a school for the hearing and visually impaired, um, located in Chennai, in the section of Tinagar. Um, so the main purposes of this closed water system is for treated water recharge and rainwater harvesting. Excuse me. Um, so this is actually a closed loop system that's built within the natural structure of the school. Um, it includes a settler for solid waste, an anaerobic tank, um, gardens for filtering water, and basically there are 30 residents who live on the campus of this school whose wastewater will be going through this filtration system where the City of a Thousand Tanks team will test it over the next year. Um, if it proves successful, which it, hopefully it will, and reaches international water standards, then they will be able to expand the entire system to the campus. Um, and over the next 30 years or so, it'll become a fully self-sufficient water community. Um, the second flagship project that I was able to go visit uh, hasn't broken ground yet, but it's called the Milo Ford Temple Tanks Project. Temple tanks are pretty common in Chennai and especially in the locality of Mylapore. Um, they're significant because Hindu is the dominant faith in Chennai. Um, and there, the temples are often constructed with tanks because of the significance of water and ceremonies that celebrate and honor both life and death. So City of a Thousand Tanks plans to first clean these temple tanks up. Um, as you can see, a lot of them are pretty murky and green. Um, these tanks are often great indicators of the state of the underground aquifer look uh, under Chennai. Um, so if the water is green, then the water under Chennai is, off, is, is more than likely green and polluted. Um, if the water is low within the tank, then the water table is also low in the temple tank. Um, the co-director of the City of a Thousand Tanks told me that in June 2019, some of these temple tanks were had maybe a drop of water if, in them, if any. Um, I also visited the Akash Ganga Trust Rain Center, which um, provided a, another nature-based solution for s sustaining your own fresh water source um, and helps different people within the city implement their own rainwater harvesting systems. Um, I visited the Care Earth Trust organization, a Chennai-based nonprofit um, that restructures wetlands, um, which are extremely significant as Chennai is a coastal city, so these help to maintain fresh water. And I went on a toxic tour with activists Nityan Yan, Jai Raman, and the Chennai Climate Action Group, which just revealed um, the effects of land use manipulation that places low-caste Chennaiites or Chennai residents near industrial plants. Um, I wrapped up my trip with four main nature-based solutions, which include cleanup, rainwater harvesting, um, using native vegetation, and equal access to both the funding to implement these new systems, um, and also just equal access to fresh water. Thank you so much for listening.
Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Neve McAuliffe. Um, I spent about five and a half weeks traveling the length of Ireland, about 366 miles, and I reported on anaerobic digestion and its byproduct, biogas, which is a sustainable energy source. I focused on mainly how biogas is being used in the Irish brewing and distilling industries. So for my presentation, I just wanted to talk about my reporting experience. And since the process of anaerobic digestion is unfortunately not very visual, I have included some of the pictures from my article. Um, so just to kick it off, back to the beginning, I came up with this idea from speaking to my aunt. Um, I knew I wanted to go to Ireland because my dad is from there, I'm a dual citizen, and I have a lot of family there, so I knew I could save on housing by staying with them. I knew I also wanted to focus on a topic dealing with climate change, since Ireland is no, known for being green, both literally and figuratively. Um, so when I was speaking to my aunt, she told me about the show that she watches called EcoEye, and they did an episode about anaerobic digestion. Um, so. Sorry, this is one of the tanks that is actually filled with the waste from a, a local craft brewery in Wicklow, and it will be sent to an anaerobic digester. So just to go into a little bit more depth, anaerobic digestion is a process that takes any organic waste, like the spent grain from brewing and distilling, and puts it into a tank with no oxygen, and as the material decomposes, it creates several different outputs, but the most valuable is biogas, because it can help offset the dependence upon natural gases. Um, so in the episode of EcoEye, they mainly, mainly focused on farming, but I knew I wanted to report on an industry that hadn't been covered, like the drinks industry. Um, because I read a couple of articles that brewers and distillers in Ireland were working to become carbon neutral and that biogas was going to be one of their, a part of those efforts. Um, but since it was a very niche topic, it was really hard to research and plan my trip. And, and it was so niche, in fact, that when I was speaking to a source at Jameson, they even said, how did you come up with this? Which I thought, you know, thank God, you know. Um, I had originally thought before I got to Ireland that the drinks industry was leading this process and the way, but when I arrived, it was completely different, which I think a lot of people in this room and other journalists can like commiserate on is that this, your story will always completely change once you start speaking with sources. So what happened? Why are they only setting it up now? Um, one is because the conflict in Ukraine has of course affected energy prices in Ireland and around the continent. So this isn't a solution to have indigenous energy to depend upon. Uh, two, it will help lessen the carbon footprint and offset the use of fossil fuels, which for a lot of companies in Ireland, like the breweries and distillery, is one of their key future goals. And three, it has become more and more important today as climate change and its effects become more drastic. This is a sustainable and renewable option that is finding a purpose for waste, and not just in the drinks industry, but any organic waste from any industry. So this is one of my sources that I spoke to Stephen Nolan from Green Generation, an anaerobic digestion plant in Kildare. He said that there's no way for a brewery or distillery to become carbon neutral without using anaerobic digestion. It's not possible and it won't happen. Um, so this large tank behind my source is one of the many tanks that holds up to tons of waste and gas. And this was one of five on this site. Um, the biggest takeaway, and something I hope you will all remember from my presentation and reporting, is that this exciting process is also actually centuries years old and is now being brought into the modern day with modern technology. And even though this is new and exciting and a new option, however, it will not be the silver bullet to solve energy crises. Um, it will help offset the dependence on fossil fuels, but it will not cut it off completely. Um, however, there are also some people who protest against the process. This was a sign I saw in Gort, County Galway, where there was a plant where there were some issues within the community. Um, according to the scientists and experts I spoke to, they explained that there is a lack of understanding about how this process works. And there are some concerns like in Gort where there's a worries about the odor from the waste, the threat of the local environment, and that the term biogas and biomethane are actually greenwashed. 
However, because they're also gases, but however, the biogas that is produced would still have been produced regardless. It would have just been in landfills and not captured and reused. Um, and according to a lecturer that I spoke to at University College Cork, with the use of biogas, you could replace maybe 60 to 64 percent of their natural gas consumption with biogas. So it cannot solve all of the problems, but it can play a role under a myriad of other options like wind and solar. And so this process is not just happening here in Ireland, but in, and not just in the drinks industry, but around the globe. So maybe keep an eye out and see if it's being used near you. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Natasha Heisenberg and I'm from Wake Forest University and this summer I had the opportunity to go to the Faroe Islands and report on the Grindadrop, which is the Faroe Islands um, term for whaling. And the Grindadrop directly translates to pilot whale killing. And since the Faroe Islands are one of the only European nations that continue to practice this tradition, it has garnered a lot of controversy for the islands. Um, and initially I became interested in this because of the controversy. But as I began investigating and initially conducting my reporting, I realized that there was a lack of information surrounding the cultural aspect to this practice, whereas most of the effects have been focused on the environmental and public health implications. So in order to do my reporting, I decided to focus on why this is integral to the culture of the Faroe Islands in addition to both the environmental and public health impacts. So in order to get a bit of perspective, this is just a map showcasing where the Faroe Islands are geographically. Um, they're very small. Um, both physically and in population size. So as you can see, they're located in the North Atlantic Ocean in between um, Iceland and Norway. And technically they are a self-governing um, autonomous region within the Kingdom of Denmark, meaning that they are not subject to EU restrictions regarding whaling. Um, and they have a population of around 49,000. So it is a very small um, community and that was reflected in my research. This is just a closer look at the islands themselves. And I was located in Torshan, the capital, which is on the island of Stromoy. Um, and I just also something I came across in my research that I think was interesting is that a lot of these islands are only accessible by boat, which just highlights the remote nature that still persists to this day. So this was an image that I took um, in a harbor in a town that was still on that same island of Stromoy, but further north than Torshan. And as you can see from the background, um, there's a lot of greenery, but not a lot of actual vegetation, and this is because the land um, in the Faroe Islands is not very fertile and it's not very conducive to agriculture or other types of farming. Um, so throughout the history of the Faroe Islands and to this present day, most of the resources that can be gained from the Faroe Islands come from the ocean, and this is reflected in the large fisheries industry, industry present and also in the whaling practices that exist. Um, so this is a view looking out um, from Torshan onto the ocean. And the way in which the Grindadrop works is that from the summer months of May to September, um, if there are pods of pilot whales spotted offshore, um, people who are whale hunters or licensed to do this work will go out, herd the whales onto certain beaches, and only certain beaches on these islands are allowed to be whaled on. Um, and then this whale, the whales will be slaughtered on these beaches and the meat will be divided up. Um, and so one thing that I encountered in my research that I thought was fascinating was um, that reflects the tight-knit community that exists on these islands is that on some islands, even to this present day, the way in which the whale meat is divided up is by household, um, and it shows just how personal this practice actually is. And in addition, most people I spoke to, um, both this ranged from people who were um, in governmental positions on the island and people who just held different positions um, but happened to live on the Faroe Islands, said that this was a large um, kind of important aspect to their culture where when these hunts would occur, people would take their families, their children to go and watch this and understand how they interact with the food and the natural resources present on the island. And this is a major theme that I also encountered, which was that this is um, a history of an island that is a harsh climatic environment and also just um, does not have a lot of natural resources. So there's this struggle to survive that a lot of people mentioned um, specifically when I was discussing why this is so important to their culture to this very day. And they say it reflects the self-sufficiency of the islands and their ability in, to rebound from certain um, kind of adversities that they face throughout their history and survive and persist. So in order to ensure that this practice is sustainable, uh, the Faroe Islands Marine Research Institute 
works closely with NAMCO, which is the North Atlantic Marine Mammal Commission, to monitor pilot whale populations and establish a maximum yield of marine species that they can take each year. Um, and while certain opponents of the hunts, certain activist groups have claimed that this may not be legitimate, um, they attest to the fact that it is and that this is something that they cl closely monitor. Another theme that I encountered was that um, this idea of sustainability, of using food that's available to you, helps reduce emissions because there's less of transportation of food from other areas to the Faroe Islands. So this is an image of Tigani's, which is the parliamentary center um, located in Torshan. And so a source I spoke with, Paul Nose, who was the communications advisor, uh, works in the government, and they oversee the Public Health Commission and the Whaling Commission. And public health has a large role in this, um, both for people who uh, oppose the hunt and also for people who live on these islands and rely on this as a source of food. Um, methyl mercury is highly potent and is a toxic chemical that is found in a lot of high trophic consumer species. And pilot whales are no exception since this is a fat soluble chemical, it biomagnifies and um, accumulates in the tissues of these organisms and humans when they ingest it also have no ability to metabolize this and therefore carry it with them. And this has um, mostly impacts on um, kind of families or pregnant women or young children in regards to neurological development. So oftentimes people who oppose the hunts argue that it is a public health threat to be consuming large quantities of whale meat. However, um, people who are proponents of the hunt say that this is something that is important to the culture and is only consumed uh, when it is available and what on special occasions and other aspects that are celebrations of traditional Faroese identity. So I would like to thank um, Professor Kat Nosa from Wake Forest University, Ken Sawyer and Libby Moeller and Hal Burton. And thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Danielle Fuljean and I'm representing Flagler College. And my project focused on the balance of a native species and a native culture in South Africa, very similarly to your project. So this is a very delicate balance. In Cape Town, South Africa, African penguins are in dramatic decline due to overfishing of sardines, a 73% decline since 1991. Many people don't know that there are actually penguins in Africa, but this is just the only species of penguin that exists in Africa. And experts predict that it might not survive the decade. Uh, I'm from South Africa, so I've grown up seeing the penguins. There are very much um, an economic drive for the country, you know, tourism, for uh, tourists to see the penguins. But South African environmentalists have proposed a ban on purseine fishing but if you're not familiar with that term, it's similar to trawl fishing, what they do here in the Northeast, where they get a big net and they scoop up a large amount of fish at one time. And this takes a dramatic population dip in the sardines. Um, so this ban would be very beneficial for the penguins, but it could also endanger the livelihood of a historically marginalized group of people, the Cape Colored people. And I wanna clarify that when I say Cape Colored, it's not an offensive term. It is what they call themselves, it's what's on the census, and I know in America there's different cultural connotations with calling somebody colored, but it's different in Africa. Um, the balance between preserving the African penguins and preserving the cultural dignity of this, of this uh, historically marginalized group is what my project aimed to explore. So this is a map of Cape Town. I grew up right there in Milnerton, uh, between Tableview and Cape Town. I could see my, uh, from my house, Table Mountain which is a, is a very large icon in Cape Town. And some places that I intended to visit were Fishhook in Calk Bay, which is a lot of um, fishermen reside there and, and practice recreational fishing, but they also go there on the off season of trolling or per scene fishing. So I'm hoping to talk to them about their experiences. Saldana Bay, which is where uh, Pioneer Fishing, a big trolling fishing company is operating out of. Simonstown and Boulders Beach, and Stony Point are all places that have high density pop penguin populations. So some cultural context, I took these images from previous trips um, to South Africa where my family is from. Uh, the Cape Colored population includes many different racial groups mixed into one, which leads them to be excluded and marginalized throughout South Africa's tumultuous history. So I'm sure we're all familiar with apartheid that happened in South Africa, where there was intense segregation between um, black Africans and other um, you know, white 
colonists, um, indigenous people, or not indigenous, but um, related to the Dutch colonists. And um, the Cape Colored people were largely left out of this because they would neither were black nor white. So they were excluded from both segregations. And this led them to feeling a lot of multi-generational pain and uh, suffering economically as a result. Uh, so the genetics include um, various tribes in Africa, Cape Malay, Malaysian people, and Dutch descent. They commonly speak Afrikaans, which is actually my first language. Uh, this is what the Dutch language evolved into in South Africa. So fishing is ancestrally a Cape Teller tradition, and many of these people have been fishing for years. Um, they are related to the Khoi and the Sun people, which were the first known people to call or to be inhabiting South Africa, way before the Zulu and Swahili, uh, the Khoi and the Sun people were there and they've got direct ties to these people. And they've been living off of the sea for generations and thousands of years. And uh, so a lot of them, fishing is in their blood in a sense. And so they go and work for these companies and they do a lot of troll fishing. And so they've been historically oppressed. And so this ban would affect a lot of people's livelihoods. A lot of family that I know, uh, know people who work on these troll boats and they are a little bit scared about what, what the future may hold for their industry. So, so I've got some various sources uh, with penguin researchers in the Morris Institute in Cape Town. I've got um, a Cape Colored fisherman in Calc Bay that uh, I've got connections with to talk about their personal story. And then Hannes de Prius is a CEO at Pioneer Fishing that engages in this type of fishing. So a lot of projects have focused on why this penguin is going extinct or critically endangered, but not a lot of people are, ex are experiencing or reporting on the fact that such a ban would you know, oppress an even further marginalized group of African people. And I have not in successfully attempted to do this story yet, although I have a little bit more time to tell you some background about what happened. I was originally planning to go in South Africa in May, and uh, due to some logistical and clerical errors in the Department of Home Offense database, I was not able to go, and I actually had to be turned around, spend 30 hours in Frankfurt Airport, and then return to the US. And this was very heartbreaking to me, because this is my home country, and, um, you know, I was blocked out of it. And I thought, you know, even though I couldn't share my story of what I learned in this, I still have a lot of knowledge about this topic. So if any of you have questions, please feel free to ask. It's not that I don't know anything. Um, but I, I, this is a very important lesson in journalism to me that I can impart to people, that sometimes your story doesn't go well. Sometimes life happens and life doesn't go well. And the best thing to do is to put your passion for the issue at hand over your grief of what happened to you. So that's what's driving me to complete the story in March of 2023. I was not able, I wanted to go in December, but um, load shedding with a very um, spotty electricity in Cape Town uh, closed down the Penguin Institute and they can only operate coming from July because their research had to be paused, they can't keep specimen because their electricity goes out very often. And they told me it will be better for me to come in March at the peak of the sardine run, where a lot of sardine are coming, the fishermen are out there like crazy, and the penguins are coming to hunt these fish. And so it would be an incredible uh, way of documenting their research in March of 2023. And although I couldn't impart with you exactly the issues of this project, I am hoping to leave all of you with this lesson that I learned that in times that your project doesn't go to plan, if any of you have probably experienced that before, that you're still able to create something really meaningful and impactful. And I'm excited to report on this in 2023. Thank you so much. And last up for this panel is our digital presentation from Grace. I'll get that started. Uh, 
Okay, hi Washington weekend folks. I'm sorry that um, I'm not there in person to be meeting you and presenting in person and I'm sorry to subject you to this weird quasi um, quasi human interaction through zoom yet again, but I am excited to tell you about my research this summer, uh, which was on fish pond aquaculture in a warming world. How is fish pond aquaculture in Hawaii going to change? How can it adapt uh, in this in this uh, sort of global warming Anthropocene era? And I should say that I've been doing research on fish ponds for the past two summers. My dad's side of the family is from Hawaii, and I've had access to the ponds uh, kind of almost throughout my life. But it was only in the past two years that I started really finding a deep interest in them. And so the knowledge that I have on the ponds and the knowledge that I'm going to share with you today, I gained um, through speaking with Kapuna or elders and not necessarily through doing the fish pond work. So I'm really grateful to be able to have gained this information and to have the um, have the opportunity to share it with you. Uh, I have a lot to say about the fish ponds and it's really important that I explain what they are before I can tell you about how climate change is affecting them. But this is just gonna be a cursory overview. So if anyone wants to talk more about ponds, I'm always, I'm always keen to share that information. But let's start with the natural processes that the ancient Hawaiians observed and that helped them ideate the concept of the ponds. So if we imagine uh, the archipelago of Hawaii and we know that there are trade winds coming in, those trade winds bring in rain clouds. Um, and if we imagine each island as kind of a circle and then it's got that topographical incline where most of the islands have a mountain, a, around the center of them. So that mountain is gonna catch the clouds that are being brought in by the trade winds. And those clouds are gonna rain fresh water down upon the land. A lot of it is gonna percolate into aquifers, but a lot of it is gonna run off. It's gonna run off through the forests, through the taro fields, through the villages and out into the sea where it forms estuarine habitat. And that's a really rich type of habitat that mix of seawater and fresh water. That's the first natural process that the ancient Hawaiians witnessed. The second one that they witnessed is the migration of fish. So um, if you're familiar with the anadromous salmon, the opposite of anadromous is catadromous. That's our vocab word for today. Um, and that's what the native uh, Hawaiian striped mullet is. It's catadromous. It spends its life in these estuaries. When it feels the urge to spawn, it leaves, it goes into the ocean, and then in the ocean it spawns, and then those that broadstock and those uh, pua, those baby fish, are going to swim back into the estuary and spend their lives there, and then the cycle is going to repeat. So that's the second natural process that the ancient Hawaiians witnessed, and I've got a little design for us. Um, so they witness it and they realize that they can leverage these natural processes. They build a lava rock wall called a kuapa around the fish pond. They're dry stacked, so it takes engineering. It's a science, it's an art, and that's what I really want to drill down on today is that if there's nothing else you take away from this, um, from this presentation, it's that um, this ancient form of aquaculture, the oldest form of aquaculture on the Pacific Rim, is truly science and it's truly an art. Um, and it, that's, that understanding is integral in order to understand how to protect it, how to preserve it, and why it's important. Anyway, so they've built this uh, lava rock wall around the estuary, around that rich, rich shoreline. But then how are the fish going to swim in? They built these sluice gates called makaha that are big enough for the baby fish to swim into, and then too small for the big grown fish that are ready to spawn to get out of. And so you've essentially trapped the fish. Um, and so when they go out to spawn, you can throw a net and try and catch them all before and they're not able to leave, or you can fish them regularly. Um, and it's really important to note that this is an extremely efficient way of eating because it's low on the trophic level, so you're not losing energy. They're just eating all of those chain diatoms, that algae, the microphotobenthos that grows naturally in estuaries, um, and then it's just low on the trophic level, so we're not wasting energy. Um, not only that, but the fish ponds had a positive spillover effect into the natural environment. Um, they were sustainable, it provided food sovereignty, overall just an amazing, amazing uh, form of art. And so I've just got some images to bring this more to life for you folks. So here we have some limu, that's seaweed, so a macro algae that's gonna grow in the ponds. Here we have an image of the pond uh, itself. So uh, within this area is the pond, out there is the ocean, and we've got this lava rock wall that extends across the shoreline. And then right there, is the makaha, if we zoom in, that's right at 
that's what we are looking at over here. Um, and then this is the makaha, that it, the sluice gate that allows the fish to swim in, the baby fish to swim in, and it prevents the larger fish from swimming out. Um, and then this is a striped mullet, and that is my dad fishing up predators from the pond. So what interested me is what's going to happen um, when climate change alters the way that these ponds can function, right? Uh, colonization and modernity have already affected the ponds. They've affected uh, what kind of fish they can grow in the ponds because of pollution, because of water, because fresh water isn't going into the sea anymore, because fish aren't naturally recruiting into the ponds. Um, so the natural processes that define the ponds aren't happening anymore, and that's kind of what has been um, my interest in the past summers, but this summer with the Pulitzer Center, I really wanted to focus on, okay, so we've got these ponds restored, what's going to happen with climate change? And in the face of climate change, there are two things that are particularly important. The first is that um, there's going to be sea level rise. So right here, this, this guy is measuring where the sea is gonna be, because if the sea overtops that lava rock wall, what are we gonna do? And the second thing is invasive species. So that's another thing that they are going to have to worry about. And here's just a photo sequence. I'm aware that I'm running out of time, but here's a photo sequence of basically waves sometimes overtop the Kuapa, king tides. They're called like ex exceptionally large tides that are attributed to climate change are already pushing these little bits of the wall off. And that's really, really frightening. Um, and so my article was about this organization that's been trying to find a way to grow native species, and that will in part help um, the, the ponds fight against the invasion of all of these non-native species that are more competitive. Um, so essentially what I have to say, and it's so hard to, to, to share all about the fish ponds and include their background in just seven minutes, but I want to say that this is an extremely important uh, um, art form that is linked to food sovereignty and food security. And the way that it goes forward is dependent on the way that climate change enacts on Hawaii. Um, so thank you very much for listening and please reach out if you have any questions. One more round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> and also for our first panel, who might have been really nervous uh, starting off the weekend. Uh, okay, let's get started with some questions. Um, I, like Kem did, I'd love to start by asking, do any of our panelists have questions for one another? Daniel, do. go ahead. Okay, so this one is for Claire and for Sydney. Um, both of you have very similar topics in water, uh, water scarcity and things like that. Um, coming from Cape Town, we also experienced a day zero. Um, and we bounced back from it somehow, <laughs> magically, through the, the cooperation of people, you know, collecting rainwater, using gray water to do car wash or lawn, collecting water in a bucket in your shower and using that to wash the clothes, things like that. How did you experience those level of water scarcity while you were actually there and reporting? Did you, was it affecting you or did you have to live with water restrictions or water scarcity? That's a question. Um, so I experienced a little bit, I mean, because I was in India for the first time ever, I just only stuck to bottled water anyway, you know, brushing my teeth, drinking all the other things. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> I probably would have gotten sick. Um, but, you know, in my hotel, like the tap water did run brown, like murky brown. I honestly should have put a photo of that in my presentation. Um, but I experienced it that way. And then also when I visited the two slums that I visited as well, as well and they showed me just the water that runs directly from the taps attached to their homes. Um, you know, I saw solid waste and things like that coming straight out of the tap. Um, a lot of times it was like orange, just like orangey color. Um, so yeah, I was okay for myself as far as, you know, I could manage. I wasn't like thirsty while I was there, but that's just what I saw from my experience. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's very striking in Mexico City is that for people who live in poverty, the water crisis is very present they recycle water already because it's already scarce. 
but that in wealthier neighborhoods, their people use much, much more water. They don't live with this crisis on their minds, and they don't do things like wash their clothes or, or recycle water within their household. Uh, I was living with roommates who are from uh, Mexico City, and they were conscious of it, but they didn't live with that economic pressure. So there was, I took really quick showers and things like that, but it's very different when you're doing that out of choice versus necessity. Any other panelist questions before I open it up to our audience? Yes. I actually have a question for Claire. Um, so you mentioned corruption. I mean, like our similars were very topics. So, I mean, our topics were very similar. Um, so I wonder how the community organizers were able to combat the corruption, even though you mentioned, you know, they were frustrated, underpaid or not paid at all. What did that look like? Often uh, they used social media or were really eager to talk to me to raise awareness. Uh, and But it's a difficult uh, problem to take on because it's very endemic and it's hard to prove often. Uh, one of the ways it showed most is that land and open space, which is so scarce in the city, but is nominally conserved, is often not protected. People will let uh, people build on it, let's say in exchange for votes or something along those lines. Uh, and I think it's really about being dogged, about coming back with more documents, coming back to the same meetings again and again, mm -hmm. was really how the people I spoke to fought that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you guys. Any questions? Out here, yes. Kristen, I'll, I'll start with you. Thanks, Libby. Are these working? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Those were fantastic presentations. Thank you all so much. And I also reported on climate change, and I'm curious for the people that you spent time with, did they see these issues as climate change issues, or did you run into people who thought like, oh, this is the natural course of things. It's a temporary problem, and it'll get better in a couple of years? You can. Yeah. Well, I mean, even though I didn't go report yet, I did a lot of pre-reporting with my sources. And um, the Penguin researchers are very much of the opinion that this is a climate change related issue, that sardines are also, uh, with the warming ocean, are also f falling to lower trophic levels, which kills them. And that was another issue that, they, that I was gonna uncover in my article. But when you speak to the fishing companies themselves, they don't see it that way. And, and I think it's often that we do find that larger corporations, larger businesses, tend to conveniently neglect issues like that that impedes their business operations. Um, so when I went to visit the community of SM Nagar, which holds about 2,000 households, um, Chennai as a coastal city uh, ha also has two distinct wet and dry seasons, which make it very susceptible to flooding. Um, and this community, community was actually located right under a bridge, so the flooding was that much more intense. Um, and so most of the families and individuals that I spoke to while I was there for the whole day um, had been in the community for generations. So it's kind of all that they had known. Um, and I spoke with two women who were around the same age. They were in their late 50s, early 60s. And they were arguing while they were speaking with me. Um, and one was saying, no, the water's so bad. It's so polluted. It's so murky. You know, it's gotten worse over time. And the other woman, woman um, was very adamant about the fact that there was no problem in Essen Nagar. It's everything is flowing as it always has. This is these are the waters that her mother and her grandmother were familiar with, and there's nothing wrong. But they said this um, as water was leaking from like a nearby public bathroom, kind of just and pooling at their feet. So um, yeah, there's definitely. A, and, and I sensed, and just from speaking with my translators as well, that there was just a, a pride. You know, I'm an American, I'm an outsider. Um, so I think for the woman who was kind of denying the issues, I think that really was her reality. Um, but it was also just kind of a sense of pride in where she was. Um, and as speaking to me, an outsider who kind of has come to point out certain issues that, that were there. Yeah. 
Um, so from the brewers and distillers that I spoke to, one of the smaller craft breweries, they were founded on the basis that they wanted their company to be of, in knowledge of the effects that it has within the climate and the climate change. So they knew that they were going to be sending their waste to anaerobic digestion regardless. But uh, larger companies like Irish Distillers, which is known for Jameson Whiskey, they are working to become carbon neutral by the end of 2026. So this is one of their key actions to reach that goal, since that is quite a lofty and very uh, approaching goal. Um, but the anaerobic digesters, there are very few sites within the Republic of Ireland, but within Northern Ireland, there are more than what's like in a smaller space than what's in the entire Republic of Ireland. So this is something that the people who are working on these digesters are really pushing as climate change is having more drastic effects in Ireland, especially for farmers and things who can then use their grass as organic waste to feed these digesters, since there are more cows in Ireland than there are people. Mm -hmm. So to then offset the waste, of course, than the effects that cows create within the atmosphere, they can then use their grass to be put into these digesters instead. Yeah. Other questions? Um, hi, thank you so much for your presentations. I have a question for Natasha and then a question for Daniel. Um, so Natasha, you mentioned that um, the Faroe Islands, they don't fall under, under EU restrictions and whaling is also a tradition that's been going on for like many generations, right? So do you see any hope for any legislative practice that might put an end to this tradition? Or um, do you think the people there are like content with how things are going? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, in talking to the people who live on these islands and have grown up on these islands their whole life, something that was especially prominent was the idea that these outside sources, um, similarly to how you discussed, coming in and dictating how they can interact with their own culture was not well received for obvious reasons. Um, and so something that was discussed not just with the people in the government who I talked to, but also just citizens, um, was how the initial activist movement against whaling, when it became popularized, um, kind of reignited this tradition, whereas it might have fallen off. A few sources I spoke to said that they thought that the whaling practices might end just because um, there's no longer as much of a need for it, but that the presence of these activists coming in from other countries um, and dictating how they can interact with the natural world surrounding them really caused uh, Faroe Islanders to cling stronger to this tradition and embrace it more than it previously had been. Hi, Daniel. Hello. Um, good luck for when you do end up traveling Thank in you. March. <laughs> My question was that uh, with the ban on fishing, how is the community that you spoke about, the indigenous community, managing their livelihood? Is uh, Are they still continuing to fish, or like regardless of the ban, or how are they managing their, their economic activities? So the ban has not been put in place yet. It is being discussed, but uh, there's a lot of strong favor for it you know as all of us i mean even with your project with outsiders coming in and suggesting things even with paula and madeline's projects where you know other i mean different societies are suggesting things i mean the idea of climate change is seen as a very western goal because we have you know metrics to to do these things and you know some people might see it as being very oppressive to the way they run their businesses or the way that they live their lives and, and the Cape Color people are no exception to that. They believe that, um, you know, they're sardines. There's millions of them. They're going to keep going every year. Their breeding rate is something like two or three spawns a week, which is a lot <laughs> when you think about fish and how many of millions of sardines that there are. They think, oh, there's just going to be an endless supply of this because it always has been. And um, with, with some of the people that I spoke to in my pre-reporting, they, they, they were aware of, you know, climate change issues that were affecting them because legislators had spoken to their companies before about this impending ban and what they want to do about it. But they said, you know, this is a life, like this is our lifestyle, this is our, our livelihood. I mean, there's a very popular, um, uh, in, in their cuisine, there's something that they call um, anchovette, which is also being distributed to Australia. 
And it is literally made of sardines and anchovies. It's a spread that they like to put on their uh, fetguk, which is another like indigenous meal of theirs that it is very culturally entwined in there. So they don't want to stop this large amount of fishing and I don't blame them. You know, it's, 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 their, it's their culture, it's who they are. And I think a lot, of, a lot of our projects have dealt with things, you know, these kind of Western ideas of climate change being pushed on um, in the more, more indigenous communities who might not be seeing it in that light. They might be seeing, this is my culture. You're, why are you trying to rob me of this? But I think that um, these companies want to make resolution with each other and, and work together to, to find an, like a healthy balance between fishing and preserving another large economic factor of the penguin. So um, hopefully I will be able to uncover more about that when I report. Maybe time for one last question, if anyone has anything. Oh, yes. Sorry, thank you. This one's for Natasha. I found your project so fascinating. How did you come up with it? I've never heard of the Faroe Islands. Maybe I'm bad for that, but I, I just, I wonder about your inspiration for that. Um, so that's a good question. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, I actually, I'm an environmental science major, so I first approached this from a more scientific lens. Um, in high school, I conducted research on whales and their populations and looked at that in a more um, objective regard. But I became interested in this after seeing the documentary, The Cove. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but it follows whaling in Taiji, Japan. Um, and it mentions the Faroe Islands as another nation that still continues to whale. And so initially when I began this project and began investigating it, I was looking at it through an ethical standpoint. Um, and I had to take a step back from that and kind of remove myself and realize that there was a lack of my understanding um, on behalf of this culture. And so I needed to view it in a more culturally sensitive way. And that's what inspired me to kind of look at it from the perspective of the people who've lived on the Faroe Islands who have been familiar with this practice their entire lives. And it was really fascinating to kind of hear um, their take on it and why they think it's important to their culture. All right, one more round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> Amazing job, everyone. Um, we are going to take another break before our next panel. So stretch your legs, get water, breathe the fresh air, um, and maybe be back here in 10 minutes if possible.